Okay, good morning, students. Uh, get your clickers ready. We have a ton of clicking today. Uh, so uh, try to get your clicks uh, on the books. And if you're in the back, you might want to move a little forward, especially if you're uh, in one of the side sections. Just saying, as a word to the wise, if you want to get clicking in, if, if you don't have clicks in today, you're going to be, you're going to be missing quite a few. And that could put a dent in your clicking. But you sit wherever you want. It's, you know, no, no skin off my nose, whatever you want to do. All right, a uh, couple things about uh, exams and so forth. Uh, first of all, the, uh, fine, the exam three uh, is uh, still, I don't know, maybe it's graded by now. Uh, hopefully it is graded by now. Uh, and I'll be able to get him in after after class. A uh, student was asking me, actually a student was asking Darian. Um, a few of you were asking uh, Darian about the clicking scores for exam three. Uh, they're not up yet. The Scantrons are not up yet. We don't have them yet. Uh, so, uh, you know, so that's still in process. Hopefully by Thursday that'll all be squared away and we'll hand back exams uh, on Thursday. Um, second thing I want to mention to you is uh, we're going to have at the last mm, 20, 30 minutes of lecture on Thursday, which is our last lecture of the semester, uh, we will have um, a clicking review sheet that is self-paced like on exam day except you know you'll be able to work with your friends and neighbors so, so you can have a study group and work everything out in class last 20 30 minutes and yeah so so uh, uh well yeah this thursday the day after tomorrow that's the last day of class for us uh so uh and i'll convert that over to some bonus points also, uh, Thursday night, maybe Friday, I'll activate another uh, study tool, uh, kind of a mega review, but it'll be in web courses, and that'll be due uh, next uh, two Wednesday nights from now. Uh, so our, our final exam uh, is mandatory. Everybody look at this. Mesmerize this. Look at it. Look at it. Look. Come on, look. All right. Uh, it's Thursday, April 26, 10 a.m. sharp. So don't come in at 1030. You know, like some other class. So for us, it's 10 o'clock. All right, don't come in at 12. You come in at 12, you're SOL. Because there'll be students that have finished easily. Most people will be finished by 12. And if you come in at 12, you're going to be, uh, you, I, I won't give you the test. You know, as soon as the first student leaves, that's when the less, last student can uh, get a test. After that, forget it. So get your you-know-what in there at 10 o'clock sharp. It's mandatory, so you don't drop this one. You take it. Everybody's taking it. And it's cumulative, so that means all the way back to January. All right? And you recall that on January, we looked at the uh, diffraction grading uh, images of an incandescent light source. And we'll be talking about that today. And we looked at hydrogen, helium, and neon. And we'll be talking about hydrogen today. Uh, so all that stuff, I, I did it the first day of class because at the end of the semester, um, that's where I want it to be. All right. So final exam, mandatorily, cumulative. And for those of you that are newbie freshmen, this is your second final exam week. Uh, my advice to you is this. Uh, make sure that you get adequate sleep. And don't get dehydrated. All right? You're going to be drinking a lot of Mountain Dew and coffee and Monsters and whatnot. Uh, to stay awake, but don't stay awake all night. I, I guarantee you, if you come to my exam at 10, after staying around all night, uh, you're going to crash and burn. Because you're, you're, to get an, a, a good grade on the final exam, 
you have to think, just like all the exams. And if you've been up all night and you're, you're uh, running on Mountain Dew for the past 36 hours, you're going to crash and burn, my friend. You may even end up in the emergency room. I, and I, I don't joke. I'm not joking. I'm not smiling. I'm not joking. I had a friend and when I was in grad school. He was an undergraduate. And he ended up in the ER. He was studying for finals week. And the next, and he blacked out or something, and he collapsed. And the next thing you know, they, he was in ER, a bunch of intravenous tubes in his arms. Why? Because he was dehydrated, right? He was, you know, too much Mountain Dew and whatnot. And uh, so don't let that happen to you. Because if you, you know, and I'm not going to give anybody a break. If you're not there, you get an incomplete or an F. And you just have to be there. There's no early, there's no early finals. There's no late finals. There's just the final. All right. So nobody gets a break. All right. Because we have so many students in here. We just got to keep things as simple as possible. We got to get, I got to herd all you guys through a single gate. And we just got to keep it simple. All right. Questions about that? Yes. The final? The question is, have you decided how long the final exam is going to be? The answer to that is Y-E-S, yes. Uh, it's going to be 100, 100 points, so like 90 Scantron items and 10 points in clicking or some variation. You know, some might be 80 Scantron, 20 points from clicking, something like that. Basically, it's going to be double of a midterm. And so that's, you know, 100 points. And so the, the advantage to you uh, as students is that uh, the advantage to you as students is that uh, you have three times as much time as a midterm because it's two hours and 50 minutes for the final and it's just double of a midterm so so hopefully everybody will have plenty of time go through all your calculations and still get out of here before the buzzer all right another question yes alexis it's going to be uh, basically similar to a midterm multiplied by two. So it might be 80, 90 Scantron items, and then, you know, 20 or so, 10 or 20. You know, whatever I don't do on Scantron, one point each, it'll be in, in clicking. So, and I might have a bonus point question on there or something. So it might be, I set it up with, you know, 80 Scantron and 25 clicking points. All right, so then you can get five bonus points if you're extra sharp. Uh, so I do that sometimes. It works out nice. All right, uh, let's talk about last time. We finished with a brain burner. I want you to and get your clickers ready, and I want you to have your clickers out, and I want you to have your brain on. And we're going to go through this one. And last time we had a brain burner question, uh, we had uh, three subatomic particles two protons, and an electron. Now, this is a simplified uh, model of, of uh, actually of an atom, a helium atom, with one electron stripped away. So two protons and an electron. And what we wanted to do was figure out the direction of the net force on this the rightmost proton. Now, I could have chosen either of the other two particles, but, you know, just for sake of conversation, for uh, mentally working things out in your, in your mind, I said try, uh, you know, the rightmost, uh, the, the net force direction on the rightmost particle. Now, uh, you can also figure out the size of the net force if you use the uh, electrical force law, the Coulomb law. Now, we talked about that last time as well. F equals K times Q1, Q2 divided by R squared looks a lot like Newton's law of universal gravitation. And notice that I have a minus sign in there. Now, when we work through this today, you're going to see how that minus sign 
um, actually um, gives the effect of or, or gives the directionality to repulsion and attraction uh, for a single particle, for, you know, for a given particle, all right? And for the particular example that we looked at last time and that we're going to look at right now, make sure your clicker is ready uh, and, your, and your brain. Um, go ahead and jot down that second form. I, I have a, a rightward arrow and then kind of a generic form. It, it's got a, and notice the denominator, uh, it's uh, kind of a generic distance quantity squared because um, depending on which two particles you consider in this setup, uh, you have a distance that, you know, you know double the distance or, or a single distance. So let's just put a distance, kind of a generic distance quantity squared, whatever it happens to be, you know, two nanometers or, or 1.5 nanometers or, or 0 0.75 nanometers or whatever the distance happens to be, you'll put it down there and square it. And uh, the numerator, okay, the first charge, Q1, I replace with just an E. All right, so that corresponds to the target proton on the right. Now, the second parenthesis in the numerator, I put in kind of a generic plus or minus E. Because to figure out one force, you use a plus E for the, the force on the rightmost proton from its nearest neighbor, the, the other red one, the other proton. And that would be plus E. But then if you also want to figure out the net force, uh, the total net force uh, on that rightmost baby, you have to take into account the force on its second neighbor out to the, to the left, and that's that blue electron. All right, so that's a minus E. So we'll put those in as we go through the next clicker questions and get this all sorted out. And just so you know that you, if you know the distances and the charges, you know how many coulombs, how many fundamental charges, E, um, then you can, you know, just plug them in. And, and K, you look it up, that's called Coulomb's constant. In the metric system, it's uh, 10, nine times 10 to the nine, uh, and it's Newton meter squared per coulomb squared, which is a weird combination of units, but that's what it is in the metric system. Now, we're not going to calculate that with, with that, but you, you, know, you can do it if you need to. Uh, we're, what we're going to do is a second way, and that is if you know one of the forces of interaction you know, between the nearest neighbors, or maybe you only know the second neighbor force, then you can figure out the other neighbor force if you know some of the distances. And I've set this up, go ahead and make a note, I didn't put it in my notes, but you can write it down, that these um, three particles are equally spaced. Okay, so whatever the distance is from the middle proton to the rightmost, that's the same distance from the middle proton over to the electron. All right. Now, if it's, if it's slightly different, you know, you can handle it, but we're going to do it fairly simple. This is kind of an idealized view. Uh, different charges, but equally spaced. So if it's half a nanometer on the left, it'll be half a nanometer on the right for this example. All right. So um, if you, for instance, know that the nearest neighbor force is 83 nanonewtons, uh, you can deal with it. Yeah, you can handle it. And it's a pretty small force, but, uh, but if, if you know that, then you can figure out the other force. And we're going to do that. Uh, using eye clickers. So uh, get your eye clicker ready. And what we're going to do is figure out the net force on this rightmost proton. All right. Given the nearest neighbor interaction force. So I'm going to tell you, okay, that in nearest neighbor proton to proton is 83 nanonewtons or 17 nano or whatever I tell you it's, it is. And we're going to get the net force from that. All right. Now, the strategy, go ahead and write down the strategy. This is actually uh, something new. I, I usually don't write out the strategy first, but here's what we're going to go. We're going to do. We have our basic setup. Now, I put a black border 
around the rightmost proton. That's our target. We want to know the, the net force on that baby. And, and a matter of fact, we want to know the constituent forces on that. So pair by pair. So here's the first pair. You know, you, you figure out the forces pair by pair. Just, you know, so you kind of break it down. So you just think, all right, if these are the only two f charges in the universe, what's the net force on them? All right. And I'm actually going to give you the size of this force. All right. So you go and then you break out the other pair. You know, so that's that's the uh, target proton with the black border. And then that uh, blue electron over there, that's a second pair. Now, so if you, you know, and if you have more particles, you have a third pair and a fourth, you know, however many you got. But this one, we just have two different pairs. And the target particle on the right is in both pairs. It's the rightmost partner of each pair. All right. So mentally, you want to, and you can just keep yourself mentally uh, organize or just write it in your notes, kind of sketch it out. You know, so these are like sub diagrams. So here's your actual, let me get my cursor over here. Come on, cursor. All right. So here's your actual uh, layout. This is what you care about, the three. But you, your sub diagram is this one. Okay, to figure out the full layout, you got to break this one out. So this is called analysis. We're breaking out components and analyzing them, and then putting the result back together at the end. And then here's my second breakout, you know, pair by pair, just break it out. And then one of the things that you got to do, you know, you break them out by pairs, you have to know if they repel or attract. That's number one thing to figure out. Okay, do these, you know, do these particles repel or attract? And then you go to the second pair, and then ask yourself, do these babies repel or attract? And what does that mean? Well, if, if they repel, then you're going to have a force in one direction. If they're attracting, you're going to have a force in the opposite direction. So if you're going to figure out net force, you've got to know left and right. And if you're in three dimensions, you've got to know a bunch of trig. Anyways, you've got to know this. So then you figure out the sizes. You know, once you get the directions, you know, once you get the nature of the interaction, that gives you a direction left or right in this diagram. And then left or right means negative or positive, you know, for, you know, when you actually put it into your, your calculator. Uh, but then you got to know what number to put in. So you got to figure out the sizes. And then you add them up. And that's actually the easy part. But this is a, you know, this whole idea of, uh, you know, this kind of an idealized molecule or atom uh, is actually um, behind... Uh, what our objective is for understanding the periodic table, all right? Because it's a very simple uh, uh, model of, a, of an atom. So clicking question number one for today. Here we go. Multiple choice. Uh, describe the force between the nearest neighbors, okay? Now, here are the nearest neighbors, these two babies, all right? Ooh, it looks like one of them was a little bit off to the side there. They're supposed to be equally spaced. I goofed that up. All right, so uh, 20 seconds to vote. Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Blast off. Uh, yeah, you guys got it. Uh, it's repulsive. Okay, so in your sub diagram, go ahead and put two arrows, and, and I just made mine red. Okay, one. You know, so that's basically what's happening. They're pushing each other apart. Now, our target particle is the one on the right. So my next question is about that. All right, so here we go. Here's the second question. Um, the nearest neighbor repulsive force on the rightmost proton, is it rightward or leftward? Now, this may seem like a cinchy question to you, but uh, it's, and I hope it is. 
But w what we've done, and we're breaking it down step by step, so that it, if I give you the final question without all these preliminary questions, you'll be able to figure it out step by step. This is the second step. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, another 5 seconds. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Uh, okay, let's uh, display that for a second, please, Darian. Okay, here's your, here's your breakdown. Now, the correct answer is uh, A, uh, the right word. It's this rightward arrow over here. All right, so if you, if you answered um, B on this one, yeah, this is the one. That's the arrow that's being exerted on your target particle. Now, the other one, if you were focused on that middle particle, you could draw in a leftward arrow and be done with it. But we're focusing on that rightward one. So you got, so you got your two forces repelling, but then you got to focus on the one that is, is affecting your target particle. Okay, so that's the rightmost one. All right, so there's your diagram. So now you can, uh, you know, I don't know, put a check mark next to it or something like that. All right, now let's do the same analysis uh for the second pair all right describe the second neighbor force on the rightmost proton 20 seconds Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ah, uh, very nice. You got most. Of you got that. All right. So now go ahead and sketch in a couple arrows. And I made mine different size, and I made them purpley, and they're pointing. They're, one of them's left, one of them's right, but now there's, that's an attractive interaction. They're pulling each other toward each other. All right now that electron's way out there, double the distance. All right, so we got that, but we, we, haven't, we haven't factored that in yet, but we're going to. All right. So let's ask another eye clicker question here. All right, you've got your second neighbor interaction force and your nearest neighbor interaction force. And I'm going to start using these two abbreviations, 2NF to symbolize second neighbor force, NNF to symbolize nearest neighbor force. Um, same size, smaller or larger, second neighbor force. Twenty seconds. And each one of these little decisions, they resemble previous decisions, uh, but you have to keep them kind of organized. You know, in your mind. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, let's display this answer here. Go ahead. All right, now we've got a distribution here. The largest group uh, did choose um, uh, B. That is the correct answer. Go ahead and switch back now. Um, it is smaller. The second neighbor force is smaller. And you might ask yourself, well, Dr. B, why is it smaller? Because it's further away. The denominator of the force law is a bigger denominator, and then it's squared, um, so it's even bigger, but it's in the denominator. So any big number you have in the denominator, your overall quotient is smaller. So it's not only a leftward force, but it's a smaller leftward force. And we're going to work this out 
Now, matter of fact, it's one-fourth as large as the nearest neighbor. Now, um, go ahead and jot down. Now, here's where I said the directions would come in. Now, let's take a look at this first one. Here's my nearest neighbor interaction. Now, I have a minus sign. That comes from the definition of Coulomb's law. That's right out front here. All right. This is for the nearest neighbor force. And my nearest neighbors are two protons. So the numerator is E and E. And then, of course, the Coulomb constant, K, you know, that's, that's in there. All right. And then whatever the distance is, D. All right, now I told you that these things were evenly spaced. So now if you look at the uh, nearest, or the second neighbor force down here, the denominator here is 2D, because it's the second neighbor out. It's twice as far as the first neighbor, or the nearest neighbor. All right, so it's a 2D down there. Now also, I want you to look at the numerator. All right, now in the second parenthesis, of my second equation block here, I have a minus E to signify or to denote, to encode the electric charge on the electron. Now notice what that does to the overall SIGN of this quotient. I've got the minus out front over here. You know, that's by definition. That's the Coulomb law. There's a minus sign. But now I've got one in here, and everything is being multiplied. So you actually have minus times minus, negative times negative, so that's a positive. And that's why over here now, I don't have any minus sign. And what does that tell you? It tells you that the direction of this force is opposite the direction of the other force. All right? Now, this one, I don't, I, I, it, it should be... Uh, it should be a minus sign down here, actually, and a po positive sign up here. Uh, but that's because of the because uh, I didn't I didn't add any trig into this. Uh, so it looks like now. So don't be deceived. This is positive here only because this is negative up here. If we put in all the trig and the vectors and stuff like that, I would have had a positive over here because it's a rightward force, and that would have changed the sign down here into um, a negative. So, so the sign, that minus sign, takes care of repulsion or attraction, right? So if you have a, a plus and a minus in the numerator, you know, it changes the sign uh, with respect to a plus E and a plus E in the numerator, or for that matter, an, a minus E and a minus E. So the, the two electrons could repel as well. You know, so that'd be a little bit, uh, you know, another uh, variation on this. Now, the part that I want to uh, bring up to you, the fact that I say, all right, second neighbor force is one-fourth as big. Why do I say that? Well, I've got this two down here in the denominator. And it's inside those brackets, and then we're squaring it. So really, the denominator is 4d squared. All right, so nearest neighbor force, just plain old d squared. No, no great shakes about this. But this one, I've got a, an extra factor of 4 in the denominator. So effectively, that's like having a 1 fourth parked out in front of everything. And then this thing right here, KEE -E over D squared, that's the, exact, that's the quotient uh, other than the minus sign for the nearest neighbor force. So this tells you that the second neighbor force is whatever the, the nearest neighbor force is times one fourth, all right, if they're evenly spaced. Now, if you have some other distance ratio, you know, that the, you know, one of them's uh, distance D and the other one's 4.9D. Well, then you're going to have 1 over 4.9 squared. If you, if you have um, more neighbors, you know, your, your third neighbor out, that would be 3D in the denominator. And you'd have a 1 ninth uh, instead of a 1 fourth here. So whatever that distance ratio, 
you square it and you go one over that and that's the shrink down factor for each of the outer neighbors relative to the nearest neighbor all right so that's so put a, a circle around that one fourth that comes from the distance double the distance one fourth the strength by the way, that's the same uh, strength relationship, Maria, as for universal gravitation. So if you're twice as far away, universal gravitation is one-fourth as strong. When you're in close, it's, it's really strong. When you're, and you're twice as far away or three times as far away, three times as far away, it would be one-ninth as strong. And something like a comet, um, you know, they can be, uh, you know, 20 times further, so what's 20 squared? 400, so 20 times further out gravitationally for a comet or something on a really oblong orbit, uh, gravity's one four hundredth of, you know, down close to the sun. All right, now, next question. Uh, Katie, a question from, from the students. The four comes from this double the distance. This is the second neighbor out. Okay, so it's twice as far away. See this? This distance here between, there's your second neighbors. Okay, that's double of what this distance is. By design, that's what I said. Okay, and so that double distance comes in right down here. All right. Now up here, this is just 1D. That's the nearest neighbor. Okay. So if that's the nearest neighbor, and if they're evenly spaced, this will be 2D. And so the 2D, 2 squared times D squared is 4D squared. All right. Good. All right. Michael. Yeah, forget about the forget about the, the as I said the minus signs here. Uh, without the trig and the unit vectors and stuff, uh, the minus signs here um, flip the direction of the force, but they don't. You know, because usually we say positive ten newtons to the right and negative ten newtons means leftward, right. but on this one it, it's I just have it set up. You know, so this is a negative quotient here, and this is a positive quotient. So for us, the, the, the gist of it is having this minus sign here and two different charges here, two different signs, a positive and a negative, adds up to a positive here. So comparing these two here, a minus up here and, a po and no minus down here, that means they switch directions, whatever the directions are. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't, because we know if we were going to draw in the arrow for this, we, kn we know it's rightward. Right. Yeah. So what's the point of the negative? It encodes the fact that the, the point of the negative sign in the definition itself is that it, it encodes repulsion and attraction when you change the signs in the numerator. Okay, so when you go uh, from uh, two equal signs, which we have in nearest neighbor, to two different signs in the second neighbor, this, that negative sign encodes the flip-flop, okay? And then the distance encodes the size, stuff like that, all right? Um, now, next question, I clicker question, number whatever it is, five. All right, so if you know that the nearest neighbor is 100 nanonewtons, how large is the second? Now, I'm not saying we already know the direction, so just how, how many nanonewtons in the, the second neighbor interaction force. And I've got them sketched over there, so we know it's leftward, so now we just got to know how big to make it. This one might require a little bit of thinking. So let's see. Double the distance, 
1 over 2 squared periodic table cumulative final a week from Thursday 10 a.m. don't be late this is subliminal messaging yeah. No early or late finals. All right, 30 seconds. Yeah, talk it over with your neighbor, double check, see if they, if they agree with you. The right size is up there. The truth is out there, as they say on the X-Files, which was a show, you know, back when these guys were all little shrimpy kids. I know there's like a new season of it like last year, right? I didn't even watch a single episode of it. Oh, it's not, it's not I, my, my little brother was like a fanatic about and most of my brothers and sisters, my little brother's wedding, you know, they, they had this, this wedding, right? And then afterwards you have the reception and everybody's dancing and, you know, having fun and stuff. But then in the middle of it, the X-Files came on. And so Ev, my brother, his wife, his new wife, my big brother, his wife, you know, all of them went up to the, the big bedroom, the big room at that hotel. <laughs> We're watching the X-Files in the middle of this maniacs I was never that I, I enjoy sometimes watching it but not like those guys all right 15 seconds 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 0 uh, go ahead and display the all right now here's what you guys voted for okay the correct answer is B a bunch of you voted for uh, C and D. Let's take a look at that. And C and D, there's your correct answer. Um, do not let me, if, if you voted for that, I'm not showing, ask for a show of hands, but if you voted for C or D, you got caught napping by me trying to trip you up with a, a shrink down factor of one half. That's option C. And a shrink down factor that's not a shrink down factor, a doubling. You know, double the distance. Ooh, so, so option D is like saying, oh, double the distance, double the size of the force. That's no good. No matter what you have, it should be a number smaller. But if you remember that the denominator of the force law is square of the distance, it's not going to be a shrink down factor one half. The distance ratio is two to one, but the shrink down factor is one to four. The square of that. All right. Last, uh, not last. Next eye clicker question. All right, put it all together. Net electrical force. Okay, so what do we got? And hopefully, you guys will. Yeah, use the amounts. So based on 100 nanonewtons for the nearest neighbor, and your answer from the previous question, correct answer from the previous question, calculate and do not let me catch you napping because remember leftward and rightward that counts you got leftward negatory rightward positive
All right, Vanessa? So do, do not let me catch anybody napping, even if you come in a few minutes late. Thirty seconds. Darian, you were here Friday. You were here Thursday. You were? Yeah, you were. Yeah, that's right. I remember now. I wanted to tell you something about it <laughs> 10 seconds 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 0 okay let's look at this here's what you guys voted for most of you got it correct that's lovely now a few of you voted for B and C let's double check those and just to jot this down, and here's the correct answer up here. Now, B and C. B and C, you know what? That, that would be the correct answer, but for a different set of charges. You know what that would be the correct answer for? Proton, proton, proton. Because that would be 100 newtons, nearest neighbor, to the right. And then another 25 newtons, second neighbor. To the right. So that means proton, proton, proton. But what we've got is an electron over there to the, to the left side, so it's pulling a little bit to the left. All right, so a total of 75. Now, 225, same thing. I don't, I don't even know what 225 is. That's an 80. I don't think any, nobody voted for 86. Uh, 225, if you, if you voted for 225, a few of you did. Make sure you double check through your notes and make sure you study uh, with a friend. All right, now, um, in general, if you know the nearest neighbor force and the distance ratios, even if there's more than one uh, extra neighbor, you know, you can go out to 17 nearest, na nearest neighbor plus another 17, and you can figure it all out. Matter of fact, if you use Pythagorean theorem, you can do, and, and a, a little bit of graph paper, you can figure it out in um, three dimensions. Two dimensions or even three dimensions. It's not hard. So you can get the net force. Now that's really important for us because we want to understand atoms and molecules. And the, the example that we just worked with is a fairly simple model of an atom. All right. So... Uh, nearest neighbor force, distance ratios, bing. Or if you, you know, if you know the uh, distances and the charges, then you just plug it into the formula. And you're, you know, but then you got to decide, okay, is it leftward, is it rightward? You still got that to do. Is it repulsive or is it attractive? Is it on the, and you know what, guys? It is, it can be really tricky. So I'm going to give you uh, so a little mini homework tonight. Uh, one or two questions, but one question of this type for you to work out uh, the nearest, there are the uh, net fours. All right. Now, let's keep going. I want to talk about atoms of the periodic table. And as you know, we looked at uh, the spectrum uh, of the hydrogen atom. And we, this particular image, this photograph, shows the central, boy, it, it doesn't look very good. Derek, can you turn all the lights off just for this slide? All right, you can see that purpley hydrogen lamp. Uh, that's the central image. Uh, go, okay, go ahead. And, all right, and then you can see that over here you have some of the purples and then the aqua teal, but we don't have the red one in view here. Uh, in this particular photo. And this is a photo from the basement of the old physics department. It's now the uh, Mathematical Sciences Building, MSB. It used to be MAP, Math and Physics. And uh, anyway, so it's down the, in the dungeon, the old big lecture hall down there. Uh, this is a photo that I took. There's kind of an idealized look at the hydrogen spectrum. Um, and 
as I mentioned, this beautiful red H alpha line is uh, over here to the right. And then we got H beta. That's that kind of aqua-ish. And then some purpley blue ones a little bit further to the left. And, you know, if, if we... One of the interesting things is if you, if you know the spacing of your diffraction grating, so if you've made it yourself or if you trust the manufacturer, you know, 300 lines per millimeter or whatever it is, and if you know the distance to your uh, light source, you know, so the distance from your eye up to the front here, and then you do a little bit of trig, you can figure out the wavelengths uh, of all these um, different colors so you know so and and it's it's not that hard you know a little bit of Pythagorean theorem and a little bit more teaching about interference not a whole lot but you could do it all right uh, and here's what we find that the as I've said before H alpha the red one uh, 656 nanometers frequency 457 terahertz go ahead and jot that down this one make a table we want to talk in terms of this table for the rest of today. Uh, the next one, the aqua, that bluish aqua line, uh, H beta, uh, 486 nanometers, and that's uh, 617 terahertz. And then the first uh, purpley blue one is called H gamma, uh, 434 nanometers. And even deeper in the purpley blue is H delta uh, at 410 nanometers, 732 terahertz. And you, you know, you keep going. Uh, you know, hydrogen's got some. You know, once you get down below 410, you're talking ultraviolet. Once you go above 700, you're talking infrared. And hydrogen's got some of each of those. You know, but. Visible is about it. So the question is, and I want you to jot this question down because it's an important one. Why isn't hydrogen lamp like a hot light bulb? Because we, we looked at that. You know, the, the hot light bulb give you the, gives you the continuous spectrum, the rainbow. But not the hydrogen lamp. You know, that, that little small tube, a vacuum tube into which a little bit of hydrogen has been in injected. And then it's zapped uh, above and below with high voltage. It starts to glow, but only those specific colors, uh, particularly these four. And I guess you can maybe get another kind of purpley blue one. That would be H epsilon. But why only these specific colors? You know, why does hydrogen only produce these colors? Is there a pattern? It doesn't seem to be random, but, you know, what is the pattern? In other words, is it, is it like frequency doubling? So look at those frequencies. Is from one to the next doubling? No. Is it a shrink down by a half or by n? No, it's not. Same thing with the wavelength. You know, what is the, what is the pattern there? It's... Because if there is some kind of, and you know, the thing is, we saw something similar with helium and also with neon, although neon has a lot of visible lines. Helium has more visible lines, um, but only certain colors. It's still a discrete spectrum. It's not all the colors. You know, that light bulb that we looked at, yeah, that had all the colors. That was a full rainbow. Uh, so why don't we, you know, you know, what is it about the hydrogen atom or atoms in general that only certain colors are emitted. The fact that there are certain colors tells sci and has told scientists since the 1800s, the late 1800s when they first picked this up, that there was some kind of underlying physics that they didn't know. They saw the pattern discrete colors, not the full spectrum. And they actually found a pattern eventually, a numeric pattern, 
Uh, but, you know, they didn't really know what it meant. But eventually people figured out. the pa- Now, here's the pattern. Here it is. I'm going to break apart this table down. There it is. 1 over lambda equals this weird quantity. The guy that figured this out, um, a guy named Joseph Balmer from Switzerland, uh, I don't know how he figured it out, but he did. Anyway, so there's a constant R, capital R, called the Rydberg. And then he said, all right, take the number 2, square it, put it in the denominator, and then take the number of your... um, your hydrogen line and square that and start with H alpha being number three. So he said, all right, if H alpha corresponds to N equals three, then and H beta corresponds to N equals four and so on, he said, yeah, it does fit this pattern. And students, this has got to be the weirdest. I mean, it's even more weird than the inverse R squared formula. And that's one formula. It's got distance squared in the denominator, but at least it kind of makes sense. You know, you want some kind of distance in the denominator because gravity, we think, gets weaker with distance. So it should be distance in the denominator for gravity, not in the numerator. Right, but how, you know, what's the physics for this? Well, this, this formula is called the Balmer formula for hydrogen. Capital R is called the Rydberg constant. Here's the value of it, 1.097 times 10 to the 7, and that's meters to the minus 1. Now, you can also call that inverse meters. Now, that's for hydrogen. Right Now, other elements, they have their own uh, analog to this, although it's tougher to figure it out. Right? Now, what happens to n equals 6? Well, with n equals 6, you know, you know the... the the calculation would go like this. All right, here we go. So here's your, here's your Balmer formula here. Let's do n equals 6. All right. You put 6 in where n was. That's 1 over 36. And you just keep this Rydberg out here in the, in the per, first parent, in the leading parenthesis. Just kind of keep that until the very end. And then 1 over 2 squared over here, that's 1 fourth. And then if you're doing this on pencil and paper, you got to go to common denominators. So well-loved common denominators from 6th grade fractions. Uh, so that's 9 over 36 for 1 fourth. And then 1 over 36 for 1 over 36. And then you subtract them. 9 minus 1 is 8. And then common denominator, 36. And then you crank it out. So you go 8 over 36 uh, equals, and then multiply by 1.097 times 10 to the 7. All right? And that works out to 2.438 times 10 to the 6. Go ahead and verify that if you want. Raise your hand if you verify that on your calculator. Who verifies? Got it? Who else? Who's got it? Anybody else verify? I see people working on it. Who's got it? You got it? Vanessa, are you you type it, trying it? Who's got ver? Okay, I see it in the back. You got one back there? Yeah? Okay, good. All right. Now, all right. Now, students, write down. I don't have it on the screen here, but you can write down 1 over lambda equals this stuff. Now, that's 1 over lambda. If you're trying to figure out the wavelength, now you got to flip-flop it, all right, to get lambda itself. All right, so let me show you how to do that. All right, so there's your answer. Uh, 2.438 times 10 to the 6. And it's inverse meters, meters to the minus 1. All right, so just, you know, flip-flop that. Okay, so you hit the 1 over button. 
or the one over X button on your calculator. And hey, you guys that have got calculators, do you verify me on this? 0 0.00000402. Anybody verify me on that? Or 4.102 times 10 to the minus something. You got that? Okay, good. Anybody else verify? Okay, good. All right. Yeah, you can verify this. So there, and, and uh, students, uh, the final exam, yeah, you might want to be ready to calculate something like this. All right. And if I did give you this on the final exam, the Rydberg would be on the cover page. The formula itself would be in the matching, and then you'd have to make some decision about how to calculate it. All right, so you might want to, and so at that being the case, it might be good for you to familiarize yourself with uh, the one over button or the inverse. And some calculators, it might say X to the minus one. So that means take whatever you've got and then flip it. All right, now this one, uh, you can write it out in terms, this is meters, you can write it out in terms of nanometers if you move it nine spaces over to the right, the decimal point. All right, so that's 410.2 nanometers, and that is deep in the violet. And that is uh, H delta uh, that we were just looking at. All right, so 656, yeah, that's H alpha. We've done that one, and we just did H delta, uh, 410.2 nanometers. And as I said, you know, Balmer came up with this. He figured out this pattern, but he didn't know the reason for it. And it's not just hydrogen. There are spect what we call spectral features in the entire spectrum of the sun. All right, now take a look at this. All right. Here's the spectrum of the SUN. Now just eyeball that. Look at it. Look at it. Not your phone, look at it. Don't look at me, look at the screen. All right. Now all those little dark spots, that's the rainbow. But it's very precisely measured, very small color bands. And so you can see that some of the colors are missing. All right. Now, what that means is that instead of emitting a certain color, the hydrogen is, is actually absorbing that from the um, incandescent surface. So there's some hydrogen in the atmosphere, and it's absorbing some of that color of light from the incandescent surface of the sun. So these lines uh, show what we call absorption features. Go ahead and write a note of the, about that. These little, you know, it's like a, seeing somebody with a gap in their smile, right? These gaps are what we call absorption features, all right? And this is not just hydrogen. This is several different elements. And we can see them in the surface and in the atmosphere of the SUN when we break down the, um, and just totally spread out the spectrum of the sun. You know, usually you see it from a prison and you see it, you know, an inch or two and it looks cool, but you don't notice these gaps, right? Your eye kind of uh, passes over that or kind of smears them all together and doesn't really pay, but they're there. Those are gaps. So helium was, this is where helium was found. They found lines, absorption lines, in the spectrum of the sun, and they said to themselves, dude, this doesn't correspond to hydrogen. Dude, it's not calcium. Man, it's not sodium. It's not nitrogen. It's not oxygen. So they invented a new element, and they said it was, we'll call this stuff helium. And then later on, they found it in natural gas, you know, component of natural gas, which is where we get it. Now, those regular absorption features in hydrogen and all the other elements um, give us a clue about the quantum structure of the hydrogen atom, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Right now, we, we all kind of know this. You know that the electron uh, orbits a proton. That's hydrogen. 
Bing. The most simple atom of all the elements. And helium's a little fancier. Neon is quite a bit fancier. But hydrogen is just basic, you know, one proton, one electron, that's it. And what we, uh, the quantum theory is this, that only certain specific orbital energy levels are permitted, like altitudes. It's like saying you can fly an airplane at 37,000 feet and 35,000 feet, but you can never fly an airplane at 36,000 feet. 203 feet altitude, all right? Now, planes, they don't, they, you know, we just take any altitude we want. But for electrons around an atom, it does seem to be this way. Only certain specific altitudes. Now, what that means is only certain specific interaction force. F delta X, energy, work, only certain specific energy levels and no others so the electrical so now we're not talking gravitational potential energy we're talking electrical epe but you know you could you know do a little calculus you can figure out the epe for this simple model you know a, pro, a proton in the center very heavy compared to the electron electrons moving the protons just kind of sitting there right energy levels and if you count them you know you number them n equals one n equals two n equals three each one of those countable energy levels is going to have a certain electrical potential energy because you know the charge you know the distance and so you can figure out delta r you know you know it's not delta x now it's f delta r and you can figure out the potential energy the energy levels all right, for every energy level. And the theory is that if, if you have an, a, an electron at an upper energy level like this, it will, just like something up at altitude, you know, what goes up must come down. All right, an electron up at this, uh, what is it, n equals 4, is going to try to come down to a lower energy level, lower energy, all right? And so it's going to deorbit or, or uh, cut down to a different, or may, this is what we call the quantum leap. Yeah, quantum leap. That's what this is talking about. Certain altitudes and no others. All right. And when we go from n equals 3 down to n equals 2, right here, that's h alpha. You calculate all the energies, it all works out. The energy, the wavelength, the frequency all works out for n equals 3 energy level down to n equals 2. n equals 4 energy level down to n equals 2. Guess what that is? That's H beta. A little bit more energy, a little bit bluer photon. All right, so the photon uh, goes out. So the jump downward, here's the jump from n equals 3 down to n equals 2. And when it jumps down, you're losing potential energy. All right? It's just like, you know, a basketball dropping altitude. It loses potential, gains kinetic. But in this case, the, the change in potential energy goes into the photon. So put a red squiggly photon leaving the atom. And that is what we see from the hydrogen tube. We see a bunch of these babies, depending on the temperature of the hydrogen, We'll see some H betas, you know, some H gammas, some H deltas, you know, maybe even an H epsilon, right? So when the electron drops to a lower EPE orbit, it emits a photon with a missing energy. And the guys that figured this out are um, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein and a bunch of others. About 110 years ago, they were figuring this all out. And here's the equation that rules it all. The energy levels 
you could figure out from Coulomb's law. The energy of the photon that takes that EPE and converts it into photon energy, ding, there's the photon energy. E equals HF. So if you figure out the frequency of your, you know, from your diffraction grating, multiply that frequency, you know, 457 terahertz by Planck's constant, and bing, you have the energy of one photon. Each red H alpha photon carries this much energy. Now, it's not a whole lot. And your retina of your eye, if the room is dark, you can pick up handfuls of photons per second. So your, your eye is fantastic, very sensitive. You know, when you look at a star in the night, you're picking up handfuls of photons per second twinkling in from that star, thousands of light years away. It's unimaginable. But yeah, this is the formula. The ener and you know what that means? It means, that the, it means that the photon is an oscillator. It's an oscillating system. And guess what? We already knew that because light is a wave, and a wave oscillates. And this is where the two views of matter Combine, Alexis, the particle view right here, photons, and the wave view, frequency, it's right in there. And these are the guys that put them together, uh, Planck and, and Einstein. And of course, the guy that really started the whole thing going, Professor von Planck, the one constant to rule them all. Now, on Thursday, I will wrap up the semester and talk about the periodic table and we'll have a review session and uh you're dismissed a little bit of homework for tonight due on thursday see you then lights lights camera action